And we're beginning a brand new series called You're Not the Boss of Me. And uh, as we begin today, let me just ask you this. How many of you are older brothers or sisters or were older brothers or you still are older brothers, sisters? Anybody here? How many of you were boss the older brothers or sisters? Anybody? So, okay, I, I, I regret that I was an older, I am an older brother. I was a bossy older brother. Many times my sister would look to me and say, you're not the boss of me. And uh, that, that still didn't stop me. Um, so this series, though, we're going to learn how to say no. No, you're not the boss of me. To some emotions that compete for control of our lives. So in, in our lives, there are things, sometimes we're not even aware of them, that are driving our lives, driving our behaviors, driving the things that we say and do. And if you, ever, you just ever had a day like this, you had a day that started bad and just got progressively worse through the day. And the reason why it got progressively worse as you look back is because there was something inside of you driving you, right? So you get up in the morning, you're running late for work, you get in your car only to meet that beautiful H1, H2, H3 freeway traffic, city traffic, and you're just getting frustrated, you're getting mad, you're going to be late now, you're trying to think of an excuse you're going to make for making, being late. Somebody cuts you off and then just disrespects you with, with the universal sign of, I don't really care for you, and you're just mad. You walk into your work or into your classroom, and you're just so mad. You don't want to participate. You don't want to contribute. And then after the meeting, you're like, man, I'm so mad. And I'm, so, I'm so dumb for not participating and contributing. And now you're mad at yourself, right? Anybody? anybody is this just me? I'm getting too emotional here. Is this just me? <laughs> right? Then you, you, you end up, you're taking that anger home. You go home. You, you know, the first thing you see is your cat or your dog sitting there. That cat or dog's been sitting there all day long. You kick the cat or dog. I never do that. I never do that. But then you, you bark at the kids, you get in a fight with your wife, you know you're wrong, but you still you keep fighting, you keep pushing the issue, and at the end of the day, you know what your summary is? Everybody is so annoying, you know, everybody's so irritating, and you know who's really irritating? You're really irritating, right? And what you don't know, what we don't know, or maybe you do, is that oftentimes there are these things that are driving us, because our lives are filtered through some emotions Sometimes, oftentimes, toxic emotions. Emotions that flavor what we think, flavor what we say, and flavor what we do. Our lives are lived out of this place within us. And some of those toxic thoughts that are within us, what they do is they distort the reality of our lives and they cause us to act a certain way. And so maybe you've experienced it before. Somebody looks at you, maybe it's your wife, and she goes, What, are you, what were you thinking? What were you, why did you, do? maybe somebody looks at you and goes, nah, that's, that's not like you. Why did you act out? And you look at yourself in the mirror and go, that wasn't like me. Why did I do that? Because all of us, this is something that's common to all of us. All of us are struggling or challenged with the reality that we think, we, we live, and we say things out of this place within us. And so in this series, we want to learn how to say no to these toxic emotions that drive our behavior. So let me ask you this question as we just begin the series. And this is going to be a lot of fun because we get, to, we get to look in the mirror and we get to deal with ourselves. Uh, let me ask you, do you know, are you aware of an emotion that drives your behavior, that competes for control of your life? For some of us, it's anger. For some of us, it's envy. For some of us, it's just a deep insecurity. It's a fear. It's a worry. All of us have different things in our lives. And scripture actually speaks a lot to this because the reality is that you and I, we live out of this place within us. Everything we do comes out of this place within us. And oftentimes it flavors in the wrong way the things that we say, the things that we think, and the things that we do. And so today I'm going to look at this as you think about, okay, what might be driving some of the things that I think, say, and do? And I want to look at an interaction that Jesus has with this guy named Matthew. Matthew was one of the followers of Jesus. He was one of the guys that wrote one of the first four books of the New Testament. They're called the Gospels. They are just a narrative of Jesus' life. Now, Matthew, when he comes into relationship with Christ, Matthew is a tax collector, which means in his culture, he is a really unpopular guy. He's taking money from his own people. And sometimes, oftentimes, he's jacking up the rate to do that. But that also means that Matthew is a wealthy guy, wealthy enough and means enough to be able to record for you and I his interactions with Jesus. And so Matthew is about to tell us what happens in one of those interactions. Now Mark, who basically heard from a guy named Peter, he records this same interaction in Mark's what's called gospel. 
And here's how it begins in Jesus' interaction with these, what they're called Pharisees, Pharisees and teachers of the law. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they came to Jesus from Jerusalem. Now, this is Matthew's way of telling us that they came to Jesus not just wanting to be his friend or have a good conversation with him. They came from Jerusalem because they're going to pick a fight with Jesus. They're trying to find something wrong with Jesus, wrong with his teaching. So Matthew's telling us they came from Jerusalem to pick a fight with Jesus. And they asked him, why do your disciples, they're noticing the disciples, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? It's what it's called, the tradition of the elders. They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, some of you moms, you're going like, they had a right to be offended, man, because what does your mom tell you? Wash your hands. After a year of COVID, we've all learned, 20 seconds underneath the faucet, wash your hands. This didn't have so much to do, though, with physical cleanliness. The real issue here, and this is real important, is moral purity, moral purity. How can somebody be pure in relationship with God? Now, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had what was called an oral tradition. Oral tradition was basically their oral commentary on the actual written law that God gave Moses, the Ten Commandments and the many other commandments. They had their own interpretation of that law, which almost began to rival the commandments that God gave. It was called oral tradition. There were rules, there were boundaries, there were regulations that they imposed on the people that gave the appearance of moral purity. It made them look like they were really close to God and they would impose this on other people. They would leverage it to control other people, their oral tradition. Now, one of these was a ritual of cleansing and the reason why they had this ritual of cleansing was because they believed in order to have moral purity, in order to have ceremonial cleanliness, in order to stay away from breaking the dietary laws which were really important to them, they went through this elaborate Ritual of washing. In fact, there's just detailed description of how you're supposed to do this. And it was all really meant to give the appearance of being close to God and the appearance of moral purity. So they, they look at Jesus and they go, Jesus, how come you don't follow our traditions? And Jesus goes, well, because your traditions don't really lead to moral purity or purity of heart. They just lead to the appearance of it. So I'm not breaking the law that God gave us. I'm just breaking the law that you're imposing on people. And your, your law can't change anybody's heart. And he didn't say all of that, but that's my commentary on what he said. So he said, that's, the real issue is moral purity. And you're, that's what God's concerned about. God's concern is purity of heart, not just looking like you have it, it's not just the appearance of it. That's what they're doing. So Jesus, now he's about to call them on their hypocrisy. I love this about Jesus. Jesus didn't just let it go by. He says, hey, wait a minute. Why do you break now the command of God for the sake of your tradition? He calls them on this. What, what, do, you, what do you mean, Jesus? Jesus says, well, God said, God said this, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, God's command is to honor your father and your mother, but you say, this is what your tradition says, that if anyone declares that what they have might be used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or their mother. So check this out. These guys were so sneaky. They had found a loophole in the law of God. There was also a commandment that was given that you could dedicate your offering to God. So what they would do was they would dedicate all of their resources and their property to God, which means it belongs to God. But while they were living, they could use their resources as they were dedicated to God. They belong to God, but my family and I can use our resources. So when their parents got elderly or older and they needed support, they could go, we'd like to help you, but everything we have is dedicated to God. Sneaky, yeah? Gives them the appearance of being morally pure, but it totally allows them to transgress the command of God. Jesus sees through all the hypocrisy, he calls them on it. You guys are supposed to honor your mom and your dad, but because you say that's dedicated to God, you're not gonna serve your family and use your resources for your family, you're wrong. You're just hypocrites. 
And so he goes on to call them that. He actually says this. He says, you guys are hypocrites. He goes right to the heart of the problem. He cuts through all of that. They fooled everybody else by the appearance of their moral purity. But Jesus goes to the heart because that's really what God's concerned about. And Jesus says this, you hypocrites. That, that word literally means pretenders. You guys are just pretenders. You're pretending to be one thing, but really, in reality, your heart is another thing. And, you know, I, I just, I want to I wanna invite you. We're in church, and I, I don't know why, but for some reason, church is the place, I think, where we pretend the most. We just do. I, I think it's probably just insecurity. We have, we kind of have a picture in our mind of what I'm supposed to be, so we try and pretend like we're that. And that really prohibits us from being able to have the heart that God wants us to have. And I just want to encourage you, you don't have to pretend. God loves you where you are. He knows exactly what's going on. The best thing you can do for yourself is not be a hypocrite, take off your mask, and let God see your heart. But he tells these guys, you guys are just pretenders with your lips You're professing nearness to God with your lips. You're creating the appearance of something. But I know your hearts. Your hearts are far from God. So he quotes this guy named Isaiah. And he says this. These people, Isaiah was right when he said this. These people, they honor me with their lips. But their hearts, that's a totally different story. Their hearts are far from God. They give the appearance. And they were the masters at doing this thing I'm going to talk about today. They were masters at monitoring their behavior. Masters at monitoring, they're making things look like they were right, but they weren't really good at caring for their heart. And so here's what he says. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. These guys were totally masters at giving the appearance that they were close to God, at giving the appearance that they were right with God. But Jesus says, I know your hearts. Your hearts are far away from God. And, and, you know, we learn at a very young age to monitor our behavior. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. In fact, in order to survive, we've got to do that. Jesus, however, is the master at bringing focus to what's really important. And in in the, you know, in the, the, the way that I grew up in Christianity, I thought it was all about behavior. And Jesus basically says it's, it's actually something different. It's about your heart. God is interested in your heart. Above all else, that's what the Heavenly Father is concerned about. Above all else, that's what I'm concerned about. So he's going to teach them about the heart. But the truth is, all of us have learned to monitor our behavior. Now, when I was five years old, and I'm not proud of this moment, but I was five years old, somebody taught me a really bad word. It is the king of all, the queen of all bad words. And, and when I was five years old, I liked the way the word, I guess I liked the way the word sound. So I walked home shouting this word at the top of my lungs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ah, blah, 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 you know. And this woman came running out of her house, and she was like angry and terrified. And back in the day when I was a kid, People grabbed you. <laughs> she grabbed me, you know, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know what I'm, you know, what am I doing? And she just, you know, chewed me out. She told my mom, and again, this is back in my day. Back in my day, my parents anyway would wash my mouth out with soap. My parents washed my mouth out with soap. That was a horrible experience. And they, they disciplined me in other ways, which was <laughs> even worse. I learned what to say and what to do. I learned to monitor my behavior so that I didn't get in that kind of trouble again. Now, that didn't change my heart because when I wasn't around my parents, and what was there came out. But when I was around my parents, I knew, don't say that word. And we learn that, right? You learn that. You learn that to go to school, to make it in your classes, to be in the right friend group. You learn what to say and what to do and what not to say and what not to do, right? If you want to get a job, you learn what to say and what to do, and you learn how to engage in that job with what to say and what to do. If you want to go on a date, you got to learn what to say and what to do. We learn to monitor our behavior. If you want to go on a second date, you need to learn what to say and do. If you want to just navigate life, right? We learn what to say and what to do. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But we've all learned how to monitor our behavior. The one thing that most of us have not learned is how to actually monitor the more important part of our lives, which is our heart. We've not learned how to care for our heart. 
And so Jesus is going to teach us how to care for our heart because that is really the most important part of us because it's out of our heart that we live our lives. It's out of our heart that if you're a parent, you parent. It's out of your heart that if you're dating somebody, you date somebody. It's out of your heart that as a boss or as an employee, you do your job or you, you're a boss or whatever. It's out of your heart that we live, love, and play. It's out of this place in our heart that we do all that we do. And so Jesus is bringing us to the heart of the matter, the thing that's really important. And what I want to help us do through this series is learn how to say no to the emotions that compete for control of our lives and how to monitor what's actually going on, not just with our behavior, but with our heart. So that we don't end up like the Pharisees who were masters at monitoring behavior, but yet whose heart was far away from God. So Jesus is way more interested in what's going on with our heart. So instead of just modifying behavior, this is what he says. He's going to go right to the root of the problem. He says in Matthew 5, 11, he says this, 15, 11, what goes into somebody's mouth does not defile them. It's not what they eat that defiles them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. Now, this was a culture that was obsessed with dietary laws and rituals and ceremonial cleanliness, which they equated with moral purity. And so when Jesus said this, they're like, wait a minute, this is totally different because we've always been told it is what comes into our mouth. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's not what you eat. It's what comes, it's the words. Whoa, Jesus is being real. It's the words that come out of your mouth. It's the things that come out of your life. Those are the things that matter. It's, it's when nobody else sees, but you're alone with your wife or your kid, and it's those words, or it's when everybody does see, and it's those embarrassing, any of you just, you know, if you've got a string of, like, embarrassing things that you say or that yet you do, then this, this is really going to help, because Jesus goes, it's not just your behavior, it's what's actually coming out of your life. Now, the disciples have lived in such a strong culture of dietary laws and rules and regulations, they don't get it. And they don't get it. So they ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, and when, he, when he, he's alone, can you, can you explain it to us? And Jesus, I love what Jesus is so funny. He says, are you guys so dull? I mean, man, what? I, it's, it's, it's evident. And then he's going to give them a picture. And he's so funny. If you can, just for a moment, take off your, I, I got to think that at this moment, every middle school boy was finally listening to what Jesus was saying. Jesus says, don't you see? that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? And all the middle schoolers are like, he just talked about poop. (laughs) Did Jesus just do that? Yeah, he he just did that. Jesus is basically saying, look, this is just physiology. It's biology. You eat something, it's digested in your stomach, and it's eliminated. That's it. So what comes into your mouth is not the big deal. It's what comes out of your mouth. Is what comes out of your life. That's the big deal. And so he goes on to say this. He says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth, those things come from the heart. Wow. No, I just did something that was uncharacteristic. In fact, I seem to do it a lot. You know, I just just said something that was uncharacteristic. But Jesus would say, well, no. Actually, that thing that you just did or said comes from a place within you, is your heart. Again, we are really good at monitoring our behavior and creating filters for ourselves. And most of the time, what we think, say, and do gets caught, especially if it shouldn't go out, gets caught by that filter. But then there's always going to be this inevitable point where something doesn't get caught by that filter and it just comes out. And that thing is going to wreck a marriage. And that thing is going to wreck a business. And it's going to wreck a career. And it's going to wreck your, and you're going to get fired. Or you're going to wreck a relationship. Or you're going to get in financial trouble because it it affects our lives in many ways. And so Jesus says, look, that thing that came out of your mouth, it actually comes from your heart. And that thing, that is what defiles you. It's not what you put in your mouth. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles and that, that word defiles, it means more than to make something unclean. It actually means, in a broader sense, to put us at odds with God. So it's what comes out of your mouth that comes from your hearts that sometimes gets through that filter. That's what puts you at odds with God. And the reason why it puts you at odds with God is because it puts you at odds with people. Wow. People that God love, loves. 
So these things that come out of our mouth, that come out of our life, man, in this culture, after this COVID moment, hasn't this COVID moment been really revealing as to, well, like, haven't you watched some of the news and just gone, like, man, what, what is going on? I mean, what is happening? Jesus would look at that and go, well, that thing that came out of their mouth or came out of their life, it comes from a place in their heart. And that thing defiles because it puts them at odds with God. And it puts them at odds with God because it puts them at odds with the people that God loves. Look, God loves people. He, and you can look around. He loves the people beside you. He loves the people in front of you. He loves the people behind you. He loves them regardless of what race they are. He loves them regardless of what social economic status they are. He loves them if they didn't vote the same way or even believe the same way as you do. He loves them. So when we hurt somebody that God loves, we put ourselves at odds with God. We defile ourselves with God when we defile ourselves with each other or put ourselves at odds with each other. Wow, right? And Jesus says, you know where all that comes from? Comes from your heart. The heart is the source of the things that come out of our mouth that is within us. It comes from this place within us, inside of us. And it comes out because it's in there. And so Jesus is like drilling down, trying to get them to understand this. The things that come out of a person's mouth come out of the place of their heart, of that person. And so he says this, for out of the heart come evil thoughts. Out of the heart come evil thoughts. Now, now he's about to talk to, about some behaviors. and we, We've all learned this, right? Every behavior starts with a thought. And Jesus says, though, that every thought comes from our heart. And so you may have been in a situation that made you frustrated, but Jesus would say, that thought that you have didn't come because the people around you made you frustrated. That thought came from you because the people around you who made you frustrated just pushed out of your heart what was already in there. So when we look at our culture and we see all the things going on, we're going, we're going like, how can that happen, that happen, that happen? And Jesus would say, well, it's because that's what's in the heart of people. And creating more laws and better rules and regulations ain't going to change the reality of what's in the heart of people. I mean, just, just think about, with me, just think about some of the stuff. We've had incredible just the surfacing of racism. That's not a new thing. That's just a buried thing. That's just a thing that we've learned to live over, and now it's surfacing up in people's hearts. You see the interaction on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever your medium, social media might be, and you're like, why are people like so, why is there so much vitriol with the political situation, the political process? It's because people's heart, it's not the political process that's creating it. Now, I'm not, I'm not meaning to oversimplify. I know there are a lot of things that are involved in this. But it's in the heart, Jesus would say, that out of the mouth or out of our life comes our behavior and the things that we think and say. Right? So during this period of COVID, I was talking with a family researcher. And she was telling me that during this period of COVID, the actual reported incidences of child abuse and domestic abuse have gone down. But she said, according to our research, the actual incidents have actually gone up. And the only reason why it's gone down is because we've been distanced from one another. Children haven't been in school where those things would normally get noticed and get reported. So they've been isolated. And domestic abuse, people haven't been going to work. So the places where they would normally get reported, they haven't been able to do that. So even though they're reported less, they're actually going up. And so where do those things come from? It comes from, Jesus would say, an evil heart. Those evil thoughts come from an evil heart. We want to go, no, 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 my heart's okay. Since the beginning of the year, there have been 225 mass shootings in the United States. Does that, does that number just blow you away? Do you ever watch the news and just go, how does that happen? In May alone, there were 69 mass shootings. And I just go like, where does that come from? It comes from, Jesus would say, evil thoughts, which don't start and originate in our brain. Jesus would say it starts and originates in our heart. So just making better laws will help to a degree, but it will not contain the evil that's in our hearts. Somehow, our hearts will find a way to live out and affect our relationships and affect the people around us. And so I love what Jesus does. He's given us reality. He's going, this is just the way that it is. So I want to help you. It's not the things that you put into your mouth that defile. It's the things that come out 
of your mouth. And those things that come out of your mouth come out of this place inside you, your heart. And so he says this, he describes, he details, he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, which leads to murder and adultery and sexual immorality, theft, false testimony or lying, slander, just talking smack about somebody. What what is the source of gossip? What is the source of tearing somebody down? It's oftentimes just the insecurity in our own hearts. Jesus is saying these things come out of us, these evil thoughts, they come out, but they're from the heart. He, Matthew only gives us a couple. Mark goes on, and again, he, he gives us the same story, but he elaborates. He says this, also what comes out is greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, which just means like lawlessness, envy, slander, arrogance, or pride, and then folly, folly. That's a fun word, right? Any of you ever used folly? Did you use it in this last week? I, I, I don't know if I've ever used folly in my lifetime. That basically means foolishness or bad judgment. That bad judgment that destroys marriages, that bad judgment that kills your career, that bad judgment that puts you in a financial hole, that bad judgment that is just embarrassing, that is habitual, that bad judgment that is just despicable, that bad judgment. Jesus says it starts with a thought, but that thought comes from a place in us. It comes from our heart. So Jesus brings it straight to the heart. He's trying to get to the real issue. And he says, these are the things that defile. These are what defile a person. You know what? It's the things that come out of us, that come from this place in our heart, that puts us at odds with God because it puts us at odds with other people. These are the things that defile us. But eating with unwashed hands, and so all of you, you know, middle schoolers can go home today and say, I heard him say it. Mom, I don't have to wash my hands. No, that's not what I'm saying today. But Jesus is just saying, but that, your tradition That doesn't make you unclean. That doesn't put you at odds with God. It's this that comes from your heart. That's what puts you at odds with God. And so Jesus, man, he's just brilliant for us, helping us navigate through this. What matters to God, what puts us at odds with God, is the fact that God loves people. So what puts us at odds with God is when we hurt the people that God loves. So Jesus says, like a good Savior would, it's not what you put in your mouth, it's really what comes out of your mouth that you need to watch because that's what's gonna defile you and put you at odds with God. And so he, he looks at our lives and he says, you know what, this is something that all of us experience, this is inside of us, and whatever is in our hearts will eventually impact all of our relationships, which is why I'm so excited about this message series because some of us are totally unaware of what's in our hearts right now, although at times we'll see it come out. You ever just thought like, man, why am I feeling like this? And you just, it's not like you can just take a time out or take a break. It just wants to come out. And Jesus is gonna help us figure out what to do with those things that just wanna come out because whatever's in our hearts, it will eventually end up into all of our relationships because that's the thing that we take in to all of our relationships. It is our heart. And so in this series, we're gonna learn to say, you're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. Isn't that good? So here's what I wanna do. I think this will be helpful. I want you to say that with me. And we're gonna say it twice. First time is like warm up because you know how first times go, Right? So can you just say with me, on the count of three, one, two, three, you're not the boss of me. Ready? One, two, three. You're not the boss of me. Good. Okay. So this time, say it with a little bit of sass, okay? (laughs) Like you're telling somebody, you're not, ready? One, two, three. You're not the boss of me. Anger, you're not the boss of me. Envy, You're not the boss of me. Guilt, you're not the boss of me. Insecurity, you're not the boss of me. Fear, worry, jealousy, you're not the boss of me. Greed, you're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. And this could be fun. Man, I've been like waiting for a moment to tell somebody, you're not the boss of me. This is it. We get to tell these things that compete for the control of our lives, you are not the boss of me. Now look, wouldn't this have been helpful when you were in middle school? Or in high school, when insecurity and fear and worry and envy and jealousy was causing you to be suspicious and do all those things, wouldn't it have been helpful to know that you did not have to be bossed around by those things? Man, it sure would have. 
Wouldn't your upbringing maybe have been different if your dad had known that anger didn't have to be the boss of him? That guilt didn't have to be the boss of him? How about your mom? If she didn't have to worry about envy being the boss of her or even anger or guilt or any of the other things. How about our kids? Wouldn't it be great if we could teach our kids that these things don't have to boss them? We can. We can. When, when I heard this from Pastor Andy Stanley, he, uh, he asked his kids this question. We used to implement this with our kids when they were little. He'd ask them, is everything okay? Not in your behavior, but in your heart. Is everything okay in your heart? Is there anybody that you're mad at? Is there anybody that you need to forgive? Is there anybody that you're having private conversations in your mind about? Is there anybody that has successfully or have had a failure recently and you've celebrated their failure because you're envious of them? Is everything okay in your heart? I think this is a really good question. We're going to ask that question to ourselves through this series. Is everything okay in our heart? Because out of our heart is where we live our life. Is everything okay in our heart? What, what if our culture would just pause before they sent that email, before they made that post, before they criticized or trolled somebody? What if they just thought long enough to go, wait a minute, what's driving this? Is everything okay in my heart? Or is it just anger? Is it just I'm not getting my way and I want my way? Is it just I'm envious, I'm jealous of them and I'm just acting out? Is everything okay in our heart? Such a good question, right? Because here, here's the reality, is that somewhere somebody is experiencing what is coming out of your heart. And it's the people that you love who are experiencing. And you're experiencing what's coming out of other people's hearts. But you can't do anything about that. But you can do something about you. You can look in the mirror. And some of us, we, we just need to take a long look in the mirror. And look, this is, this is all of us, right? We need to take a long look in the mirror and see what's coming out of our lives. And not so that we can build a better filter or learn to modify so that nobody sees that, so that we can let God come and do what only God can do, which is transform our hearts. He's the only one who can transform our hearts. We can learn to build better filters and we can learn to behave better, but only God can reach down to the place where everything comes out of and change that place in you and I. And so God wants to meet us in that place. And so Jesus... As we're doing this, he wants to meet us in that place. As we say, you're not the boss of me. And if you're a follower of Christ, here, here's what we already know, right? We already do have a boss of us. A better boss than anger, a better boss than envy, a better boss than fear and insecurity, a better boss than jealousy. We have a boss, Jesus. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I love this. Jesus says to us, our boss says to us, come to me. Come to me. He doesn't say, man, I want you to work harder, spend more energy, building a better filter, learn to monitor your behavior. He says, no, no, no. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And they were weary and burdened because they were trying to do the law of God, the traditions of the elders. They were trying to implement all these things to give the appearance or to make it look like or to be in relationship with God. And Jesus says, no, just come to me and I will give you rest. Woo. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. I will deliver you. I will set you free from those controlling behaviors that drive your life. I will set you free from those things that are in you that sometimes pop out of your life and you go, where did that come from? I will set you free from those. I will set you free from the things that defile, that put you at odds with God because they put you at odds with other people. I will give you rest. And then Jesus says somewhere else, he says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me and I'll give you peace. And he says, I'm not gonna give it to you the way that the world tries to give you peace. Because the way that the world tries to give us peace, the world's peace is the sense that if everything is great on the outside, then I have peace on the inside. Jesus says, man, I got something way better than that. I can give you peace on the inside even when, especially when, everything is not good on the outside. So here's what he asks us to do. If you're wondering, like, how do I get that peace? He says, come to me. Follow me. Not, not just say a prayer, but follow me and let me be the boss of you. Just come to me. Just follow me. 
Just let me be the boss of you. Just take my yoke upon you. He goes on to say in Matthew 11, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in your hearts and you will find rest for your soul. Just come to me, follow me, let me be the boss of you and take my yoke upon you. And that, that idea, that picture literally means Jesus is saying, take my way of life upon you. Take off the old, which in order to do that, we need to take off an old way of life in order to put on the Jesus way of life. And the, the biblical word for that is just, it's, it's repentance. This is where we have a change of heart and a change of mind, a change of direction. We're heading in one way and God says, I want you to come in this way. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Take off that old yoke. Take off that old way of life and come and I want to give you a brand new way of life. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me today. And I'm going to give you a brand new way of life. A way of life that will lead to rest for your souls a way of life that will lead to peace in your heart. Not just because everything's good out here, but because everything's good in here. Take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest for your souls. And so Jesus goes straight to the heart of the matter, because we live out of our hearts. And he tells them, look, it's not what you put in you, it's what comes out of your life. It's the things that slip oftentimes through the filter of our life. Those are the things that put us at odds with God because they put us at odds with other people. And so Jesus says, I've come to give you not just more behavior modifications. I've come to actually give you a solution to your heart problem. And this is why Jesus came for you and I. He lived a perfect life in our place, the life that we should have lived. And then he died on a cross to deal with the poison that tries to infect our hearts, to deal with the things that try and influence our hearts. Jesus died on a cross to pay the price for those things, to give us the ultimate solution, not just better behavior, a better filter, but a transformed heart. Only God can transform our hearts. Isn't that awesome? Especially for some of you, you go, man, I thought that being a Christian was like, behaving and following rules because that's what I thought. I thought that being a Christian was being a good person and I learned how to play the game of being a good person. That didn't change my heart though. I thought that being a Christian was following certain behaviors and if you've been doing that and you're like, I'm weary and I'm tired, I got great news for you. Being a Christian is about having a transformed heart and there's only one who can give you a transformed heart and it's Jesus because there's only one who paid the price for your sinful, evil heart and that's Jesus. And when he rose from the dead, that was our assurance that we can trust him to give us a brand new heart. Not just better behavior, not just better filters, but a pure heart, real moral purity, real purity of heart, not just the appearance of it. And so he says, come to me, follow me. Let me be the boss of your life. Take my way of life upon you. And you'll find rest and you'll find peace. Let's pray together. Father, we we are so grateful, God. Lord, you're the one who engineered our lives and you've engineered our hearts. In fact, as as one of the, the early fathers of the church said, Lord, you created us and you created our hearts to find their rest in you. And until we do, our hearts are just restless. So Lord, we thank you that we can come to you We can follow you. Lord, we can let you be the boss of our lives and take your way of life upon us. And God, your way of life will literally transform our hearts and our lives. So as we just continue in this moment of prayer, let me just ask you, is everything okay in your heart? Is everything okay in your heart? Is there somebody that you're mad at? Have you been having some conversations, invisible conversation with them in your head? Is there somebody in this, maybe in this last week you celebrated their failure? Is there somebody maybe that you need to forgive? Do you just have some reoccurring embarrassing behaviors that keep coming out? 
is everything going to care in your heart. Hey, thank you for watching the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. Hit that like button, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. You'll receive weekly content like sermons and worship music. Great stuff. Also, you can follow us on social media, and if you'd like to give, go to gracehonolulu.org. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week right here online. God bless you.